Past players, past legends, past legends. Oh, I did. As, as it turned out, um, uh, Brian Wilson, who was the president of Woodville, was uh, Carmel's dad, <laughs> my okay. wife's dad. So yep. I had a bit of a connection with Woodville <laughs> in, a, in its own funny way. But um, oh, no, I really enjoyed it there. Um, I, you know, the first day we went to training, there was 90 players, I reckon. <laughs> what the hell are we going to do here? But uh, uh, Bruce, I'm, I'm really pleased that Bruce came with me because um, we, we did it all together. And then when I shot through... Uh, he was able to, you know, to get the uh, the premiership uh, win, which was wonderful. And uh, but he, he was a he was a great footy thinker as well. So you now we had a lot of fun though. And my and my factory was at eight twenty two Port Road, so I just had to walk down the road. To go yeah, to far Port away, Road's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> well, was that something that the SNFL approached you about, or was that generally the uh, Woodville West Torrens Footy Club? No, no, Woodville West Torrens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I can't remember specifically what happened because that's not because I'm getting old. But uh, it was uh, it was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed it, um, and I, not that I didn't uh, still believe in Norwood and love Norwood. I thought it was probably my my time. I'd been there for a fair while, and it was a good thing to do. So as it turned out, it was um, it really helped me um, in the longer term as well to you know to go to uh, to another club. So and we finished up. Sadly, at Melbourne for a few years, which didn't work as well as uh, we we would have liked it to have worked. But um, yeah, let's it, get it. Uh, let's get a few things there, though, Barmy. You did get all Australian coach in '94. You, you're nice and unlucky. You've got Schwartz, who's pretty close to the best player. You know, he's with Carey as an absolute gun. He gets injured. Line get Line gets injured. Tinge. Tinge, and you know, Todd Viney goes to coach Mark Philippoussis, like. You're nice and unlucky. You didn't have four of your best, uh, you know, 40 out. You lost four of your best, probably six or yeah, seven. Um, like, was, you was, were unlucky. God. Yeah, I was. A, uh, we were a bit unlucky. And then also they ran out of dough and think they might bloody merge with Hawthorne. And, oh, God, can you imagine how that, how that went? I mean, that was awful. And then all of a sudden, because of that, uh, the Joe Goodnicks of the world come in and he, he wouldn't know shit from clay if you don't mind me my my terminology no, I, I don't i was pretty sure you don't exchange christmas cards that was horrible horrible for me um but in a lot of ways it was the best thing that ever happened because it said well hang on maybe coaching is not what you should do but you should stay in footy and it probably got me to uh, ultimately go to footy admin which um has probably suited me even better than coaching in lots of ways so I mean, it's it's rare that um, things happen, and there's not something good about them. But um, it was pretty pretty unpleasant and uncomfortable time when uh, Goodnick was around. So, um, how, but, you know, and I haven't really forgiven Melbourne for that to a degree because it was awful, really. Oh, getting sacked virtually at half time over the radio it was extraordinary. It was <laughs> yeah, bizarre. It was wasn't it? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Talk, talking about the uh, Melbourne Hawthorne merger. How close was that to, to happening, or were you involved with some of the discussions with that? Oh, well, I'd spoken to the Melbourne people, and I had to say that I supported it because that's what the board decided to do, but I thought it was a stupid idea. But uh, it was never really going to happen because Hawthorne didn't want it to happen at all. And it, it would have made no sense at all because if you merge Hawthorne and Melbourne, what happens? One of them loses their, who they are. Maybe they both do. I mean, it was it was just madness, and it was only it was they were just strapped for cash and didn't know what to do and didn't know what their next step was and and didn't have the money and all that sort of stuff. So I really felt a bit sorry for them in a way because people like Ian Ridley and those guys were wonderful people, but they were just battling to uh, to survive a bit. But um, no, it was it, it should never should never have been considered and was never really going to happen as it turned out. No, fair call. Um, I know you did mention this a little bit with uh, Joseph Gutnick. Um, you know the the problems with the what I call the front of house and back of house with a bit of a chefing uh, background. In that, if they don't work together, it doesn't work. Did that really mould you into the administrator that you are today with that experience? Oh, I think I already knew that. To be fair, but it did. It certainly did. Um, 
reinforce what I what I believed in. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But uh, you've got to be honest with people, and you got to they got to trust you. And if they trust you, you got a decent chance to get the best out of them. But and that's not what was happening at that that stage. No. And then the administrative career, Collingwood, Collingwood, uh, you, you know, nearly got up to in the grand final there, where ironically a goal umpiring call against Rocker probably cost Collingwood dearly there. So you unlucky there, and then of course. We'll get onto the uh, the Geelong side of it with with Harles and and that side of it, um, but yeah, great career in administration as well, Barmy. Go through some of you know starting off at Collingwood and all that side of things. Yeah, well, the Collingwood with time was fantastic, and we, we were a bit stiff. Um, we did lose a couple of grand finals and we're against the AFL team because uh, the AFL looked after Brisbane in those days. Um, but that you know that was just the way it was. But we were we were a little bit stiff, but we were, we were pretty competitive and very strong. And you know I think I had a reasonable influence there, and I, I really kind of enjoy, I enjoyed my Collingwood time. But I'd sort of come to the end of it in the end, and I was lucky enough to uh, to get to Geelong, who were fantastic. They're wonderful culture. Um, Cookie was fantastic. I mean Tommy Harley was an old um, Adelaide mate, as yeah. it turned out, and. Um, and he's done really well, and he's now, what does he say, uh, Sydney or yep. whatever. So, yep. no, he's a, you know, really good fella. But um, no, Ge- Geelong was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed that. Bomber was good fun in the early days, and then we appointed Scotty as well. So, um, no, I, I genuinely, in, um, I mean, I enjoyed the Collingwood time. I really did. But um, even more so at Geelong. I'm still, I've still got a lot of time for Geelong. I think they're you know, a really good bunch of people and do things the right way, personally. But, um um, you know, I've, I've been lucky. Uh, I've had some good things to do in footy. And um, then I went back to Collingwood for a couple of years because I wanted to help Bucks. And I saw him the other day, and he's a terrific person. Um, but I wasn't really able to quite get that done either, sadly. But uh, that's only because I think they went a bit mad themselves but, uh, from inside. But but then that led me to um, going back to the Tigers, which in the end was probably the is going to be my legacy in footy because... You know, they, I'm a Richmond man deep down because yep. I played for them and um, had, I've, I've had some wonderful times. You know, I'm, I'm still hanging around there. I'm not doing quite as much as I did before, but still very engaged and very much a, a Richmond man. And Rick, I can't walk down the street without somebody talking to me. So uh, that's probably not a bad thing, is it? Uh, not at all. No. Uh, who was instrumental in getting you to Collingwood, the, you know, in the first place? Oh, Eddie appointed me. I'm not quite sure what... what um, what what the influence was and who was uh, the, the ones who knew what they were doing. But, no, Eddie certainly appointed me, yeah, Eddie McGuire. Yeah. And, and you were mates with Mick Malthouse from your well, Richmond no, days? Yeah, I'd play, I'd, I'd like, yeah, I'd played Play with him at Richmond, so it was terrific. I really, uh, really loved playing with him. So, <laughs> but, but it was quite funny because, um, you know, sure he was coaching the first year and then was always going to give it away. And um, and then so Ed comes to us and said, well, well what are we going to do about a coach? So, oh, well, there's, the process is there. There's plenty of people out there. Let's go and talk to them all and go through it all. And he said, well, what about Mouldhouse? Would he be any good? I said, well, yeah, well, he's been wonderful at the West Coast and I think he'd be terrific. Um, we should put him through the process. Well, he came back three days' time and said, Mouldhouse is coming to coach us, <laughs> which is, which is wow. kind of not that helpful to us in terms of footy management because we weren't able to, you know, talk to him about what we needed from him and what we yeah. needed to do and all that. And not that it was a hell of a problem because Mick was a bloody good coach, and, but uh, he didn't really feel, he felt that he had to satisfy Ed rather than all of us, which it didn't really help us in the long run. Long run and Mick became a bit of it too much about Mick in the end too. I, uh, I, I, I felt that way. I mean, and that's a little bit unkind in a way, but I think he did. But I think, you know, you, you, it's model behaviour. You do what you think the club wants you to do. Mm-hmm. And clearly Ed was running the show and he, he did, couldn't help it either. He was so um, ego-driven himself. Not, not in a nasty way, but that's what he is. You know, he yeah. did, wouldn't have thought he was doing the wrong thing. But it, 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 in footy, you've got to be all on the same page and you've got to be looking after each other and sacrificing for each other and helping each other, whereas there was a little bit of perhaps uh, selfishness about it, I thought. That's, and, but that's my opinion. I'm probably a little bit hard on them. And did Geelong headhunt you or did you sort of say, look, I need to step back a little bit and then the discussion started or how did that all come about? 
Oh, fortunately, um, I, I was really good, um, real, been really close to Gareth Andrews over the years. He had a real estate business in Richmond and then he actually came and played. He played and then was general manager of footy for us and then finished up on the board back at Geelong. And he, he was the one, as much as anyone, who uh, who encouraged um, uh, Geelong to talk to me about, uh, about the footy management area so um but i was pretty close to cookie cookie was very good brian cook was very good so um, i always love the way you mentioned brian cook and you speak of him in in the same reverence as wally so you know that for me shows how much you respected and how much of an influence he was as well and and i love it that it's ironic interviewing tom harley tom harley speaks glowingly of neil Baum and vice versa yeah. so i've always enjoyed that side of it as well um I you know, interviewed Harles last season at a function in Sydney, and yeah, he spoke glowingly of you and and obviously your relationship with Tom. And then you know, let's face it, he, Tom comes in; he's a little bit of a surprise choice as captain because he wasn't the gun. And he, you have the problem with Steve Johnson, and you correctly back Harles and the leadership group to fix it, and they did. Yes, no, no. Ours is very. Um, it gets it. He get he gets what footy's all about, um, which is why he's doing the job he's doing. But um, it, it's it's so much about looking after each other and caring about each other. I mean, you still have to make the hard decisions. If Jono was a complete dickhead, you got to get rid of him. But he wasn't. He was just a bit naughty. So we went to the, the players wanted to handle it, and they did, and they did it really well. Um, but it, we knew what was going to happen from it, and that was the important. I, I must admit, I did. I I'd caught up with Dane Swan this morning doing something else, and uh, and he was a similar to Jono in uh, as a bloke, and he'd been involved in a bit of a fight with some people, but he'd gone in to help his mates and all that sort of stuff. And I always remember that um, Eddie was keen to, you know, well, we got to give him, you know, a thousand weeks or burn him off or something. I said, well, hang on a minute. I said, well, what if your son was in that circumstance and his mates were in trouble? What would you want him to do? Would you want him to go in there and help his mates or would you piss off and look after himself? Oh, yeah, you got a point. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's the way. That's just the way you have to do it. We, we're only dealing with people and we can help them if we can. If, they, if they're complete deals, well, you get rid of them because you have to because they're not living to your values. But if they're just a a little bit naughty, well, you've got to be a bit um, understanding of them and uh, put your arm around them a bit. And I, I think that's that's where footy's gone. We're much better at that yeah. now than we ever were. Oh, look, and Eddie tries to deny it and says, no, nothing would have happened and all that. But I think D Swan ending up at Brownlow Millis and a Collingwood great has got a lot to do with N Balm, a, a bit more than E Maguire. So, yeah. yeah. Well, with Geelong, uh, obviously... This was a little bit ahead of the time. They had a little bit of a mid-season, not crisis as such, but a bit of a reset and a bit of a re-evaluation of the, of the club mid-year, and it really stood them in good stead from that point onwards with uh, Mark Bomber-Thompson. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, most of it's all pretty logical. You go, OK, what have we got? Where are we? What are we doing? What, what are, how are we reacting? What, et cetera, et cetera. It's all... You know, it's just people management, really. I mean, it's uh, but but you've got to be honest about it. You've got to look at it. And you've got to say, okay, what can we do? And then somehow you've got to encourage the players to enjoy taking responsibility for what's going to happen. Because I've always had this crazy saying that the guy who's got the ball at his feet is CEO of the club. <laughs> because if yeah. he picks it up, we, we're it. going to be all right. If he doesn't pick it up, we're not. Yeah. And that's that's the depth of it. I mean, the players are really totally responsible for what happens to us and we've got to encourage them to take that responsibility and enjoy it and play that way and that's kind of what we had to do at uh, Geelong to a degree is say well come on we're, we're good enough for this um, you just just take your responsibility enjoy it look look forward to it let's do it we're, we're good enough to do it and uh, and then that and that's I mean not every team can say that because every team's not going to win. But um, if you are good enough and you do it well enough and you control it well enough and you sacrifice yourself for all your teammates and you work for each other, well, the multiplier effect is quite uh, significant. And it held Geelong in pretty good stead from that point onwards. Yeah, yeah, well, they were. Uh, they were uh, good fun to work with, I must admit, and uh, they hadn't won for a bloody long time, so I took the credit for that as well. As usual. Fair call. <laughs> yeah, why not, Barbie? And yeah, you know, you've still got that bag with the boot with the brick in it. Yeah, you've still got to carry that around. Yeah. 
I do. It's got Ed, Richmond NB on it now. It used to have uh, GFC NB on it before. <laughs> and Barmy, I think you've been pretty heavily involved in, in, in with the startup of women's footy. And, and it's only with that, when I was interviewing you, the article those years ago, where I made the point where I'd been to watch Nord in a Sam, the girls in a Sample Grand Final. They had they hadn't kicked a goal against South in the minor round and thought, right, it's more important to be around when you know you're going to lose. Anyone can be around a winner, but let's you know, do the right thing and be around when we're, when we're going to lose. And if you told me I'd be at a women game chanting Nord and yelling out number 35, bat five, and you know, that sort of thing, because what really won me over was the girls' buy-in. The guy who misses out, and he's 23rd, 24th. In a grand 25th, final, yep. 25th players you know, dummies on the dirt and all that sort of thing. Their girls was a complete buy-in, buy-in and they were just so all together as a group. And Barmy said, well, it's funny you say that because the Richmond 2017 side together was so much for a group. And I said, well, that might explain the result a bit, uh, the result a bit more than, you know, uh, than we all thought. So I reckon that was a really important point, uh, Barmy. Oh, well, it is. I mean, that's that, that's the hard thing in footy. If you don't get a game, you think you're being left out. But, I mean, it depends on how close you are with your mates and how much you accept that and understand it. I mean, our, our 17 guys were fantastic. But, um, I mean, I must say, if you're talking about the girls, the girls, they are they are so grateful to be involved in this yeah. silly game. Uh, they're, yeah. they're all wonderful. And um, they'll just get better and better and better as they go. But... I mean, it's, it's sometimes a bit hard to sell that story because if you're not in the team, you think, oh, bugger it, I'm not in the team, so who cares? But if you work together and you commit yourselves together and you understand that at the end of the day, you can only pick 22 blokes or 23 blokes to play or and just accept your role within the club and, um, and look after your mates, well, you're a much more powerful organisation and you're a much better person yourself. And then when it's your turn, they're still going to pick you. But if you go against them, they're not going to pick you. Uh, so it's sort of – it's selfish in one way because you understand that, but, I mean, it's really selfless in so many other ways that you're part of the act and let's go. And I think the point there where you said about the girls are so appreciative is just spot on. So, Nord, you know, Nord, we had the, the, the showdown in the first round and so involved in that and and, and go on the, you know, the Wolf Blast Centre afterwards and – the girls are thanking you for the chance to be in the room. And, yeah, it's you know, true, it's though, just, it? yeah, yeah, it's sort of yeah. the other way around than what, you know, what we get. And, yeah, I was, oh, no, you're more than welcome. And you're just sort of, wow, as an attitude. So it is, it is yeah, it, it is, as you said, that they are just so engrossed that they're, they're wrapped to be a part of the foot of the game. They're more the game than probably the footy industry. And yeah. I, I still enjoy yeah, that it, side it's of it. It's such a challenge. The poor old girls, because as I like to say to our girls, we've been playing since 1858. <laughs> yeah. You've got a long way to go. And then they have, but they're getting better and better as they go. I, I saw our girls played uh, Brisbane two weeks ago. And I, it was just it was so much better than they played before. Whereas last week they played and they got beaten and didn't play all that well. So they've still got a fair way to go. But uh, the week before they were wonderful. So um that's part of it. They'll, they'll keep learning. And, um, I mean, the game's much more complex now than it ever used to be also, which is, uh, makes it even harder for them in funny ways. Well, obviously, in 2016, you left Collingwood and came home, as you put it, to Richmond. Um, Dimmer was in the same sort of situation as what Mark Thompson was. Were you able to put an arm around him and, and sort of say, or mentor him a little bit in to say, look, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to go about it. And then from then onwards, Richmond haven't uh, looked back. Yeah, to agree, I did. He'd been to the US and done a few things because he realised that he had to change a little bit of what he was doing. He'd been, he'd been fantastic. Um, but I think um, principally in 2016, he was kind of, he felt that he had to make sure that the players knew if they did something wrong. And so he was really focusing on that to, to fix it, which is right, because if, if it doesn't work, well, you've got to fix it. You've got to do something about it. But but the, my feeling was that he'd been a bit too negative. It was a bit too bit too much of the what the hell did you do that for rather than, 
you know, the same in the same terminology, you can say, can well, we do it a different way? have a look at that. What do you think you should do now and how can I help you? Is telling them the same thing. but And I think that's what he changed. He changed that because the blokes were sort of hating him to a degree because he's always into them. But he wasn't meaning to be into them. He was trying to help them be better. And I think he changed his uh, way of doing that in 17, which uh, which gave us a real real shot at it. So, uh, no, he was a, a damn good coach. He, he figured all that out himself. He, again, I think he principally, he genuinely said, I'm, I've got to make sure that I coach them well and get them to know what they're doing right and wrong. But he was doing it in probably a slightly more negative way than he should have, and then, then he wasn't. So that really helped us uh, enormously in 17. And, yeah, so... 37-year drought broken. Yes, yes. I took credit for that as well. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. <laughs> so out, call again. Out of that, then probably the next, you're a bit unlucky to run into a ramp at Mason Cox in a prelim. And then, oh, wasn't he fantastic? Yeah, that, that night he was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably never reached anywhere near that level again since. But, yeah, it was quite incredible that night. But then... Co- you know the footy having, having to move around and COVID, so we, it was. It's been a bit of a bizarre era as well. Yeah, it was challenging the uh, the other, but we, we were terrific. We, you know, we cope with it better than anyone else. I don't quite show, sure why, but I think we just accepted where we were. So, you know, to win seventeen and then nineteen and twenty was um, unbelievable. <laughs> Particularly when you think back to what. Silly bloody Brendan Gale said some time yeah. before, he said, we're going to have 100,000 members and win three flags. And I was like, you got mad. Well, guess what? You we got 100,000 yeah, members and we won three flags. So yeah. it's, um, it's wonderful. It's really beautiful um, reinforcement for what he believed uh, for, for our footy club because he is, he is an outstanding um, administrator, a good person, let, lets us do our job, but knows enough to uh, to – buy in when he needs to buy in but uh, very good very very good and quite incredible really where you said Richmond probably did that best and buy in and all that where they're negative about playing at Marvel and I think Hardwick's attitude there has hurt Richmond in the end so it's quite weird that the buy in to COVID and be up in Queensland all in the bubble and all that yet we don't want to drive five minutes down the road to Marvel. It's yeah, it's yeah, a weird I comparison. I don't, I, don't, isn't I, don't, it? I don't get it. I must admit, I don't get it. We we should never have said it because yeah, it silly. my view is you can play on the moon. It doesn't yeah. matter where you play. It's, it's only you against them. Exactly. The ground doesn't do anything. So yeah. um, I'm really frustrated by it. Well, I think it's more coincidence than reality. But maybe a few of our players, you know, don't don't like playing there. But there's no reason. Not, if you had to choose a place to play footy. You'd play in the place that's got a roof, so it doesn't matter whether it yeah. rains, and it's, and it's got a beautiful surface. Yeah, so it's... that's where you'd play, wouldn't you? But yeah, well, so, uh, I guess I guess uh, any of us who play at the MCG yeah. love playing at the MCG yeah. as well. But um, you know, so, we don't love playing at Footy Park that much because the wind changes at quarter time. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. With the Adelaide Oval, it's just a touch more comfortable. Yeah, um... <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Barmy. There's a couple of things we've got to bring up. Modern footy, where we're at. I thought Maynard last night that, thank goodness, the tribunal showed some common sense. Um, I don't want you to comment on this one, but I'm really worried about Laura Kane's first week, I think, trying too hard and trying to place an imprint. And There's a bit of lack of footy now there. I don't want you to add anything there. That's just my thoughts. But, um, you know, where the game's at, we, we understand there's a lot of things happening behind the, the game legality wise and a couple of lawyers I'd love to shoot as well. But um we're at, we get that it's had to change, but surely the main bit was just a footy accident for goodness sake. You know, it, it's not he's tried to smother. If you're trying to bump someone, tackle someone, yeah, there's that physicality side of it if it goes wrong. Yeah, we can understand getting banned for that, but a smother for goodness sake? Well that, that if they don't want that they have to say the rule says you're not allowed to jump in the air to smother. Yeah. If which... they, and if they do that, we get it. But, I mean, I must admit, I, I you know, well, you know what I'm like, yeah. but um, yeah. I thought that they should have let him off because it wasn't fair. He, he didn't do anything wrong. No. But I'd, I thought he'd get weeks because that's what they've done all year. I mean, we had a kid, uh, Nigel Mansell, who, uh, Ryan Mansell, who he bumped into a bloke and he got three weeks. 
I mean, it, it, there was no intent, and, and it was it was Aish. No, 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 you're not allowed to touch. You're not allowed to touch an Aish. You're not allowed to touch an Aish. That's fair enough. Come on, Barmy. Should have got three weeks. Not allowed to touch an Aish. Yep. <laughs> no, but even Aish said, "Yeah, I know. He shouldn't I know. have been rubbed out." Yeah. I yeah, mean, I... so I thought, well, if clearly they're going to give him time because they almost have to the way they've acted throughout the year. But I'm really pleased they didn't because I didn't. I just don't think it's fair. Um, but I, I think we're trying to solve the unsolvable. Yes, mm-hmm. and that's reality. that's the I mean, point that you can't eliminate all physicality from the game. We, we've got we, the head must be sacrosanct. We've got to try and help. We all get that. And yes, the game's at it, but you can't eliminate all footy accidents. And that, for mine, was very much just a footy accident. And and well, it's a classic. I case feel of- so, we all feel sorry for Brayshaw. Yep. But oh, I, I also yeah, exactly. agree agree that Kane Corn, where he said he doesn't turn to protect himself, he's a real worry. He's one of those. He's tunnel vision and doesn't get the act of protecting himself, um, and it's unlucky, and we feel sorry for him. But don't hang out the poor person. Otherwise, well, you've got a, you've also got one hundred and sixty eight years of evolution of that that people are jumping, uh, tackling. That, yeah, all right, we need to change the tackling and the head high stuff, but the the running and jumping to smother the ball has been in the game since day dot. Yeah, it's it's very, I mean, it's it's just almost impossible to... What we've done is we've rubbed blokes out in terms of what's happened to the player, the yes, outcome. The exactly. outcome's this, therefore it's someone's fault. And yeah. that, that's why we were worried about um, the Maynard thing, because clearly yes. something had happened and it was, was clearly his fault in that he bumped into him. But he didn't certainly didn't mean it. There was no intent or whatever. But uh, it, it's really challenging. I, I'm, you know, I think they've bitten off more they can chew in a way, and, and they're doing it for the right reasons. But I'm yeah. not quite sure of how, yeah. how we're going to get the outcome. Exactly. It's um, very challenging. Now, a, lot, but, a lot of grey grey area at the moment still to work through. So yeah, vitally, Barmy, you're going through. Have gone through some uh, health challenges. You had your first ever episode of an epilepsy attack at the age of seventy, which is quite. It's a, it's unusual, but it, it is a bit more over, over as we get older, and all that. And you've had now to watch yourself a bit more carefully with your health. As blokes, we've probably all we've all done it, all been invincible. And a couple of times, you probably didn't watch your health as afterwards as closely as you, you now need to. But you've you you now understand exactly what you've got to do, and. You've bought in and there's a, an epilepsy walk coming up. Fill us all in there, Barmy, please. Yeah, I've, I've always been a little bit naughty with, with my behaviour, but no, it was, there was certainly no history of epilepsy at all. And um, yeah. I had this bloody amazing um, seizure and fit, and, and I was lucky that Carmel was there and looked after me. I finished up in hospital or whatever. But um, but then and I went and made of ours works in the uh, with the... Um, Epilepsy Foundation, and she said, "Well, do you, do, can you help us promote this? You know what, what what's going on around it." And uh, I normally wouldn't do that sort of thing, but I thought, "No, it's not a bad idea." But and because people are a little bit kind of almost ashamed of being epileptic, if you know what yeah. I mean, and they don't talk about it's it enough. Silly. And, yeah, but but also the challenge of epilepsy is they don't know what causes it. It just happens. Yeah. And fortunately, I've got some medication that helps me, and it. It's controlled the the whole um, seizure thing, but apparently only seventy percent of the people get that. Thirty percent, they they just their medication doesn't control it. So we do need, you know, some money to try and find out what makes it happen and look after the people who have got it who, who uh, the medication doesn't help, etc. So um, they, they do the uh, the walk for epilepsy all through October, and I'm going to do something with it as well. And you know, we're trying to raise a bit of money for people. So I. I you know, I've been really pleased to support them and help us. I've done, you know, plenty of stuff around the place promoting it, and I've been everywhere talking about it, um, which is, again, not usually like me, but I'm really pleased and proud that I have because there's been some wonderful response to it. Um, and But we do need for people to... If you, if you go to the Walk for Epilepsy uh, uh, website and look, up, look out my name or whatever and see if you can give 50 bucks or something to help. And if we get enough of those sorts of things, we might be able to uh, do a bit more research and get on top of it. So, I oh. mean, it's, it's something that I'm really proud that um, I'm supporting and, and doing. We'll, oh. we'll promote that on our socials as well. Yeah, I'll certainly do that. And, you know, let's be honest too. 
MMD until Neil Danaher with that was oh absolutely it's, know, it's not it's not dissimilar no, to that at all it's no. the same, same yeah principally the same yeah you know, it was funny with that was with MMD and then I did an article on David on David Palm and I didn't know till talking to Jenny David's uh, David's sister that that Jim uh, Palmy's dad had died of MMD. And that and oh gee, oh, I didn't realise that either. Yeah, 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 yeah so it's just a yeah. lot more. Yeah, you probably can remember Jim back in those days because he was bloody good at the bar, uh, Palmy Senior. He, that was how he <laughs> he always gave directions. You ne- you didn't go down Green Hill Road. You went past the fe- you went past the feathers, and then you turned at the feathers, <laughs> drove down, and then you go on that next left, and you'll go past the Kenzie, and then the Marrickville, and yeah. No, he was, he was, a, lady, char- yeah, he was yeah. a character, Palmy Senior. Oh, I have been to all those places. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, th- I think we all have, Palmy. Uh, Palmy. <laughs> all right, Palmy, we'll go through right then your uh, uh, hard- hardest opponents. Yeah, you can mention a couple. You don't yep. have to mention one or two. You can do three or four. Oh, there's lots of them. I mean, Jeff South was a beautiful player, but I, I always struggled to get a kick against David Darcy. Would you believe that? Yeah, looks good. Um, yep. But I played on him a couple of times. He played very well. And even Cowboy Neal was always, I found, difficult to get a kick on. But um, He's struggling oh, health-wise lots, lots as other, well, too. Yeah. Lots, lots of other ones as well. But, um, no, some beautiful players playing. And, um, I, yeah, I just enjoyed playing the game. But uh, some of those were hard to get a kick on. It wasn't much fun. But uh, I think Dave might have got a couple of three votes against me at some <laughs> stage. <laughs> and of course, best players played, you know, with as well. Like your Richmond, your Richmond side, you know, Bartlett, Stewart, you know, Burke, oh, yeah. if you, if you if you don't like Bartlett, Stuart Burke and Royce Hart, et cetera, you're not, yeah. you're not fair dinkum. But, um, but there's some beautiful players. I mean, if you, you can't go past, you know, the Careys and the, and that of the world and the Jakovic's and, and even Dusty Martin now. Like, you know, it's very hard to find a better player than Dusty. He's got such beautiful you know, feeling around the ball, et cetera. But um, uh, there's lo- lots of beauties. But Because um, oh, I've always said Royce Hart in terms of a mate Bushy will be listening. He's a Richmond fanatic. And I said, well, if I'm Royce Hart versus Carey, it's a toss-up, and that's how good a player Royce Hart was. Oh, Royce was and Royce is only six one and a half, six two max or something, and but he just Incredible beautiful reach. jump of the ball, yeah. marvelous kick, he busted his gut the whole time. You got everything out of him. He, he's fantastic. Yeah, great to play with. He was um, very, very important, very important player for us. Yeah, but um, you know, it's almost impossible to pick the best player because there's so many really good players around. But um, you know, Gary Abbott was pretty good and the young bloke was pretty good as well. And, yeah, yeah I mean, lot, lots of very, very, very good players. I mean, Joel Selwood, I, if, if you had to pick a team to play for your life, you'd nearly yeah. pick Joel Selwood yeah. in it, I reckon. He's sort of like the Alan Border of, uh, of batsman footballers. Yeah, you play, you pick Selwood to play for your life any day. Yes, exactly, you would, yeah. Your yeah. 1994 All-Australian team has some pretty handy names in it as well. Uh, Silvani. Oh, he, was, he could play a bit, couldn't he? <laughs> Greg Williams, Guy McKenna, oh, Glenn Jakovic. Oh, yeah, Blue, Blue is beautiful. Yeah, and Jacko, yeah. Oh, I mean, that, that's what I mean. You just can't you can't go past them, really. They're wonderful, wonderful. And even in the real old days, I mean, the, Bobby Skilton's been up, up as the, whatever he is, the champion of champions, the champions today from yeah. the AFL. And, yeah. I mean, blokes like him, you can't go past them. They're beautiful, beautiful players. I mean, as you said, Ian Stewart before. and I mean, they're uh, they're just wonderful players. Now, I have to ask, uh, was there an opportunity for you potentially to come to the Crows? Oh, yeah, we, we were very serious about it. Um, and again, I didn't particularly want to leave Richmond. I love Richmond, but... Um, Rue had spoken to me quite a bit about the possibility of coming and it was only really because I had this crazy um, seizure stuff that um, my medico said to me, said, you're crazy if you take on a more uh, more anxiety in your, in your work and I'd recommend that you don't do that. And that's really what made our mind up in the end because I, I reckon there's a reasonable chance I probably could have come. Yeah. To, uh, to to help the crows, um, and I, I reckon I, you know, I could have had a, had a decent influence as well. But um, but it wasn't. It was just they said, "Don't do it. Uh, you're crazy if you do it," because you know who knows what could happen. So, yeah. um, but no, we, we were certainly serious about it. Yeah, oh, I like we the... love Adelaide. I mean, can't, obviously, Carmel's families from Adelaide, and we're um, 
you know, I love living in Adelaide, had a great time and loved the place. So um, we were very serious about it, but uh, didn't do it. Now, Barmy did me a real favour at this lunch a couple of weeks ago, Pete, without even realising it. Someone's asked, you know, that was there a day where everything just went in sync as a player or a coach? And Barmy read the room and said... Uh, the 1984 SNFL Grand Final. So I've quickly glimpsed around the room and I've seen which people are clapping. So I've made a beeline about my book straight after Barmy's got off stage. And I did okay that day, Barmy, so don't worry. I was well in front of giving you a lift back to town, so that was greatly appreciated. <laughs> well, it was, it was certainly a wonderful day, I must say. It's um, one of the days you remember... Um, very, very, very vividly. Yeah, beautiful. And you've got a book as well. Do you want to give that a little plug? Oh, yes. I mean, Anson Cameron wrote yes. a beautiful book called um, Neil Baum, The Tale of Two Men. And um, well, what how it happened is that Carmel and the kids were convinced, trying to say, you should write a book. You've been in footy for 50 years. And I said, oh, that's the last thing I want to do, blow my own trumpet. Um, and then they knew that I knew Anson very well. And I'd he'd written about a dozen books and I'd read them all and they... He was a friend of ours uh, anyway. So I said, well, what if we got Anson to write it? And I said, well, now you're talking. But he did a great job because he, he interviewed me for ages and got all the stories around it. And then, but then he went out to the real world and got the truth. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so the story, know. it's very good. It's a f- fantastic, um, I think, you know. Again, no, it's I a great say, book. I'm... Yeah, it's a good footy story book, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, no, I love my mentions. I thought they were the highlight of the book too, Barbie. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've got an autographed copy. Yeah, there. I come on, have a couple in that regard. <laughs> um, I, it was one moment with... Um, Anson and that, and I said to Anson, "Geez, is it people you know, expect you're just going to give them a give a, a copy of your book and answer?" And Barmy's gone, "Oh no, Malcolm, you've started him." And away he went. And, uh, Anson probably spoke in terms of his frustration in that regard about the same as Barmy does on Joe Goodnick. So it was a, it was in a conversation <laughs> for the next few minutes. Uh, he's a good man. He's yes. a terrific man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you're you know sort of uh, dimmer finishing up, you know. Could you sort of see that coming with him, you know, no, sort of being a I, bit frustrated or? I, I didn't, I didn't at all, but that's probably because I'm such a positive bloke, I, I think, but uh, I didn't see it coming. But I, I was really proud of him for being, uh, trusting us enough to tell us what he felt. And he felt that he wasn't getting his message across and he felt that he didn't quite have the energy to pick it up and he probably thought he'd done his work. Um and that, um, that was wonderful that he said that because it gave us a chance to make a decision on him. And, um, you know, because in the good old days, the coach had just coached forever until you had to sack yeah. him in a, in a way. Yep. Uh, but it was really, I'm, I'm really proud of him for the fact that he, you know, he was able to tell us the truth. Um, and then people say, oh, we reckon he was already talking to Gold Coast now, whether he was or he wasn't. We don't think he was, but it, even if he were, it doesn't really matter because um, we're that proud of him for doing that. He's said, Footy needs the Damien Hardwicks. Yeah. So we're pleased that he's at, he's at uh, the Gold Coast. We're not going to barrack for him when he plays us, but we're really pleased that he is because he's one of our, he's one of our men. We, we like to look after him. Mm. Um, so it was a bit unusual and challenging for us and all that sort of stuff. But, it's, you know, in a way, it's given us an opportunity to, you know, to reset where we are and reorganise ourselves without having to sack someone, having a, an, an awful uh, period with that because... The players still love him and respect him enormously, and so there's no nastiness around it. And uh, we've we've moved on. So, um, you know, as challenging as it was and has been, it's um, it was the best way it could have been dealt with. I thought, and and that's where footy clubs have, we've come a long way. Yeah. In the good old days, if someone left, you hope they break their leg and yeah. never do anything ever again. But we we don't think that he's he's one of ours. Bloody oath. Yeah. Well, and as his king is, and as his um, fly Mc, McRae and. Uh, well, and you know, as, and for me, uh, Kenny Hinckley is as well. I know too many of them. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way it should be, Barmy. And look, oh, I think well, there's no doubt, no doubt in my mind. Yeah. And look, as a Nord per, I, I I love it where you hammer the point that Nord Football Club is your club, and you know, gr- greatly appreciate that. You know, always love spending time with you and and that and privileged in that way. But yeah, always as a Nord, you know, I love you. You really make that point, and. It's that we feel that's pretty important, and, and you know something greatly appreciate as well, Barmy. Oh, thank you. Now, I, well, I, well, you know that I, that's the way I think anyway. Yes. Yeah. yeah, mate. Uh, I have to thank you for everything that uh, that you've 
provided the footy. Uh, 270 games at Norwood, 49 at Woodville West Torrens, 98 at Melbourne as a coach, but more importantly, 176 as uh, a player. Uh, my all-time favourite grand final, which we've mentioned uh, on one of our flashback segments here on, on our uh, podcast, was the 84 grand final. And I reckon I could almost uh, call word for word for the first quarter of that grand final. So uh, it's been a great honour and a privilege for me to speak to you tonight and uh, keep up the good work, mate. Thanks, Barmy. Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. No, thanks, thanks Barmy, and look forward to catching up, mate. Thanks, Barmy. Good on you. Thanks, mate. Thanks.